Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. So we're spending the first few weeks of this year having a look at the massive global scale technologies that might actually contribute towards the almost unimaginably Herculean task of reversing the freight train of global human CO2 emissions increases and replacing fossil fuels for good. There really are loads of technologies to look at with more and more coming online every week. But alongside these amazing initiatives and inventions, there remains a second, possibly even more important challenge. One that needs to be addressed just as urgently and just as comprehensively. And that challenge is population growth and resources management. We've touched on this before, of course, when we looked at the UN and IPCC reports that came out in 2018. But I thought it was just worth taking stock of where we're at right now and have a think about all the changes our societies need to make to make sure that we don't undermine the technological changes that are coming online. Now, you regular viewers out there have demonstrated yourself to be a very well-informed group of people, so no doubt you're already very well aware of all this stuff already, but it never hurts to remind ourselves of some of the facts and figures. And a lot of you also know that I do love a good graph. So here's one from the United Nations showing population growth since 1 AD. Agriculture got going about 8,000 years ago and at that point it's reckoned there were about 5 million human beings. By the year 1 AD we'd reached something like 200 million. Global population rose constantly from then on with the notable exception of this dip when Europe got a bit of a kick in from bubonic plague and lost about 60% of its population. By 1800 though there were a billion people on the planet by which time some bright spark had invented coal-fired steam engines and an industrial revolution erupted out of the United Kingdom, spreading all over Europe to North America and eventually across the world. By the early 20th century, the graph had gone exponential. When my dad was born in 1943, the population number was 2.36 billion, and experts said that the planet wouldn't be able to sustain more than 3 billion people. But by the time I came along in 1969, we'd already grown to 3.6 billion. Today that number stands at 7.6 billion and you'd be forgiven for thinking that we had ourselves a full-scale, completely out of control population explosion going on. But here's the remarkable thing. There's been a massive drop in fertility rates since the second half of the 20th century as living standards, gender equality and women's education have all taken a positive tilt upwards. Here's another UN chart showing fertility rates around the globe back in 1950 Dark blue represents fewer than 1.5 kids on average and as you go through the light blues and indigos and into the greens and yellows and oranges the number of kids per family increases until you reach dark red which represents 7 or 8 kids per family. So what happens to that map as we travel through time to the present day? Well this happens. Clearly there's still work to be done in sub-Saharan Africa, but even with that factored in, the global average fertility rate today is just below 2.5 children, less than half what it was only 50 years ago. Nowadays you're more likely to read reports like this one, talking about fertility slowdowns and problems with population replacement than reports of population booms. Despite that though, we're still on track to hit 11 billion people by the year 2100. So how come? Well, to demonstrate that, I've borrowed a visual aid from a brilliant statistician called Hans Rosling. Sadly, Hans is no longer with us, but his shows were brilliant, and you can watch one of his best by clicking the link at the top of the screen. So anyway, I've got some cubes here made out of uh, fairly badly wrapped old boxes of tea. I am English after all. And each one of these represents a billion people. And to keep things simple, we'll use the same 7 billion population that Hans Rosling used four years ago. So how do the age groups stack up? Well, you've got 2 billion kids here under the age of 15. Then you've got 2 billion people between the age of 15 and 30. Then you've got another billion people between the age of 30 and 45. And another billion between the age of 45 and 60. And then a final billion uh, over 60s. So straight away you can see you've got 3 billion people missing from these age groups. So where are those people? Well, some of them aren't there because they died early, but most of them aren't there because they were never born in the first place. Because, of course, back before 1980, there were fewer people, and so fewer people having babies. So, what happens to this construction as time goes by from now? Well, this group of over 60s, unfortunately, in 15 years' time, 
time to die for them. So they go, everyone gets 15 years older, the young people have two billion children. And then another 15 years goes by. Unfortunately for this group of over 60s, which I think is my group now, time for them to die as well. So they go, everyone gets another 15 years older. These young people have two billion children. We go another 15 years, this group of over 60s, time for them to go. These young people have two billion children. And there you have it, before long, within three generations, with no increase in fertility rates and no increase in life expectancy, just by the inevitable fill up of human beings based on how many people are on the planet today, you get to 10, 10 billion people. And actually statisticians do say that old people will live a little bit longer and they have to add another billion people on for that. So there is your 11 billion people by 2100. So the big question is, can our planet sustain 11 billion people? Well, the answer to that crucial question, of course, is that it depends on how we live and use the resources that are available to us. Now, I'm just getting warmed up here, so brace yourselves. Let's look at population density, first of all. Back on our UN map, we've changed our color code to show how density is distributed globally. Very dark brown represents over a thousand people for every square kilometer of land. The very light beige color represents between zero and 10 people per square kilometer. It's pretty easy to see the impact that India and China have with 1.35 and 1.4 billion inhabitants shoehorned into those two countries. But Northern Europe and Eastern United States actually have very similar population densities as well. In fact, if everyone in the world today lived in the same way as the residents of Manhattan, then the entire 7.6 billion of us would fit onto New Zealand. Well, according to that map, there's masses of space all over the place for a population expansion, and our planet will barely even notice 11 billion people, right? Well, of course, it's not just space that we need, but food, water, and shelter, as well as, you know, leaving a little bit of space for all the other species of flora and fauna to coexist so that our global ecosystems have some chance of staying in balance. And that means we get to look at some more graphs. Some of you may have seen program four of Just Have a Think way back in April of last year. Back then we established that 50% of all habitable land on our planet is used for agriculture. We also found out that of that 50% of land, 77% is used for livestock and only 23% for human consumption crops. It also turned out that the livestock land yielded only 17% of human consumed calories and only 33% of protein. Whereas the 23% of land used for crops yields 83% of human consumed calories and 67% of protein. So straight off the bat, if anybody tells you you won't get all your protein if you don't eat meat, they're just plain wrong. Now obviously those statistics are not evenly distributed around the globe. So here's your next chart. This one comes courtesy of the website ourworldindata.org. And by the way, I'll leave links to all these websites in the comments section below. You can navigate this one for yourself because it's interactive. So let's start over here in the east. If everyone adopted the diet of the people of Bangladesh, and there's 160 odd million of them now, then we'd need less than 15% of our habitable land for agriculture. Indonesia is pretty close at just over 18% and there's about 270 million of them. Then you've got the 1.35 billion people of India. If we all adopted their diet, then we'd use up 22% of our available land. Or if you're not a big fan of curry and you prefer a Chinese, then we could all adopt their diet and still only use about 40% of our land. And you can see that Africa has similar statistics. And the reason for this frugality of land use, of course, is that the diets of all these countries, at least currently, are predominantly plant-based. So they don't have to set aside vast tracts of land to grow cereal crops to feed the animals in order to fatten them up so that they can kill them and eat them. No, they just eat the crops. Contrast that to our mind-bogglingly overindulgent lifestyles in the so-called advanced Western civilizations, and you start to get an idea of where the real issues lie. Our famously food-passionate European neighbors in France and Italy, as well as in the Alpine regions, have a very meat-dominated diet. As a result, if we all live the same way as them, 
we'd need 122% of our total habitable land to sustain us, which I think you'll agree is arithmetically impossible. Scandinavia is very similar, with Sweden coming in at 126%. Then we swing over to you guys in Canada. If we all adopted your average diet, then we'd need about 130% of all habitable land to keep going. And down in the States, that number increases still further to almost 140%. And don't think you get away scot-free down there in Oz just because you're parked out of the way. No, no, we can see you. And we can see that you're the second worst offender on the planet at a whopping 158% of habitable land required based on your average diet. But the prize for the most ridiculous and profligate dietary habits goes to Argentina. If we all ain't like those folks, then we'd need to set aside agricultural land equivalent to almost 162% of all habitable space on Earth. So let's be clear, those global disparities are A, insane, B, unnecessary, and C, unsustainable. The World Resources Institute produces some really great information about how we in the West can tweak our diets to reduce our impact. All the links will be in the comments section below, but here's some highlights. Number one, currently the world is actually increasing the amount of meat it consumes as developing nations grow more wealthy. Number two, rich Western nations already consume far more calories and protein than they need. This chart shows animal-based protein consumption in red and plant-based protein consumption in green. The black horizontal line is set at 50 grams of protein per person per day, which is the amount we actually need in our diets. So only India is anywhere near the mark and the rest of us are massively over consuming. In fact, if you're an average American, then in order to supplement your plant-based protein intake with meat to get you to your total daily requirement of 50 grams, you would actually only need to eat a single four ounce chicken breast. Or you could of course just eat more plant-based protein. Number three, this chart shows the land and water resources required to produce various animal and plant-based foodstuffs. All the plant-based stuff on the left is low in land use and irrigation. At the other end of the scale, beef production is such a catastrophically profligate overuse of precious resources that if we just took this one foodstuff on its own out of the equation, then the resources problem would be more or less resolved immediately. Number four, we'll need 70% more calories to feed 9.7 billion people by 2050, and even more than that for the 11 billion people that we're expecting by 2100. But here's the good news if you're a meat eater. Although you would be far better off and healthier if you did move to a fully plant-based diet, you don't have to go the full vegan in order to make a massive positive difference. This chart shows that even if you keep eating meat but reduce your overall intake by half, for example by only eating meat three days a week, you'd get your land use and greenhouse gas emissions down to levels that are not much more than people on a vegetarian diet. So that's the message. Sackcloth and ashes and ritual weekly self-flagellation are not actually required on this one. We just need to have a think about what we consume and get ourselves out of our unhealthy Western mindset that a meal is not a real meal unless some part of a dead animal is on the plate. It's not true. It never has been true, and it will not be sustainable into the future. That's it for this week. We're back on the technology track next week with a look at direct air carbon capture and storage. If you enjoy these programs and you think they're useful, please like and share them with your social network. And most important of all, please subscribe to the channel to get the word out to as many people as possible. We've just this week nudged past the 1,000 subscriber mark, so a massive thank you to all those of you who've chosen to join our little community of communicators. It's absolutely free to join us and subscribe. It's only a couple of clicks away, and the first click is right here. Thanks very much for watching. Have a great week, and remember to just have a think. See you next week.